Welcome, Welcome everyone to our show. Ron Ray here, and I'm joined with Debbie from Florida and Catherine Loft from Melbourne. How are you guys? How are you, Debbie? Wonderful, Ron. It's good to see you. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me on your program. You're most welcome. We're very excited today to be talking about one of Debbie and I's <laughs> most favorite book, <laughs> uh, which is um, the poem of the man God. And um, our title today is the book that Pedro Pio ordered every believer to read. So Pedro Pio said that he doesn't ask us to read this book, but he orders everyone to read it. So it's a it's an amazing book, and it's a book of a, a lot of controversy as well. And um, there's a lot of mixed thoughts out there in the Catholic and Christian world about whether we should read it or not. And we thought we'll invite Catherine, who is um, the manager and head of the Australian Readers Group for Maria of Our Tortas, Poem of the Man God, and as well as a um, the creator of the website, one of the I think most comprehensive websites out there on the um, on Maria Valtorta and the book, which is called valtorta.org.au. So thank you again, um, Catherine. Now, would you like to just tell us a little bit about yourself and um, how you got into uh, following Maria Valtorta and the the Poem of the Man God? Um, yes. Um, well, first of all, the Maria Val Tortas Group is based in Australia and I am the coordinator, but it is in contact with um, English-speaking readers from 18 countries. Um, David Murray was the founder and when he was 60 years old, he went on a pilgrimage uh, in the early 90s and um, a lot of people were reading Val Torta, so he wanted to read it too, which he did. And when he came back, he said, there's no one to share it with. So he started meetings in a little parish hall and the numbers were small, but um, people did come and eventually he thought, I might do this around Australia, which he did. And then he went to Canada and the US and then he went to Ireland and the UK and then he went to Italy to get permission to become a distributor. When he came back, he then started a, a newsletter just to keep like-minded people in touch. Meanwhile, I went into a shop in the early 90s looking for a present for my mother um, for her birthday and the helpful assistant said to me, oh, by the way, have you read Val Torta? And I said, no, and she showed me this book, which you know how thick it is, and it was called The mm. Poem of the Man God, and I thought, um, maybe next time I said to her. Anyway, she said, well, what about this little book? And it's an abridged version of the passion, death and resurrection of Jesus from the poem of the man God. So I said, yes, I'll read it. So I read it on the weekend and on Monday I was back there and I bought the full set. Um, then when David was about 83, um, he felt it was time for him to sort of slow down. So he handed it over to me. And at that time, I also met Stephen Austin from the USA. And he's not only our webmaster, but he's also written a lot of the articles and the information that's on our on our website, which was um, what you were um, complimenting us on. Yeah. It's a lot and um, mm -hmm. Debbie, Debbie um, would you like to tell us a little bit about your experience as an introduction as well with the with the poem of the mango well this was many years ago um that i came across a friend of mine uh, i think this was in the late 80s early 90s um she gave me a copy of the first volume of poem of the man god and she said you really need to read this and and you know, Kelly and I were very close friends and uh, really, you know, shared our Catholic faith. And I said, okay. And she said, this is just going to be, it's not like anything you've ever read. And uh, uh, I was telling Catherine before we came on, the first volume particularly, I just cried through, I, I just wept through the whole thing because it is such an intimate um, look at, uh, into the life of Mary, the Holy Family, the life of Christ, 
these hidden years, particularly. And, and of course, it, it goes, you know, as you get through the volumes, it's it's uh, Jesus's public life as well. But uh, I think the thing that struck me most in the beginning reading them was this very intimate look at the Holy Family and and Jesus's hidden life as a child. And it's it's so beautifully written. It is so richly uh, the the descriptions are so so rich and so vivid that uh, it just it, it just it's a very emotional. It's been a very emotional experience for me um to to discover the the uh the books and uh i can see why padre pio would uh, want everyone to read these because it gives you such a a, a different view of of n not only jesus but the holy family um mary um mary's family it, 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 everything is just uh, it's just beautifully, beautifully presented in these books. And when you read them, you just feel like there's no way that someone, just a person could have just it's made written. this up. You, yeah. you, you feel that Holy Spirit coming through because this is the only way. Um, and, and I think, sorry to interrupt, but I think it was Pope Pius. I can't remember the Pope Pius, but he said he after reading it, he said, uh, I think he recommends everyone to read it and to make their mind up for themselves mm -hmm. that this is obviously an inspired work. So uh, I can't remember the exact quote. Do you remember that quote that I'm talking about? Yes, he, he said, uh, publish this work as it is. Whoever reads it will understand. Yes. Perfectly sad because you do understand when you read it you realize that no no human mind no this is holy spirit inspired and there's there's just no other way uh, that you could uh, you could see these things and you could know these things it's it's as and i mother, know. Teresa, mother mm -hmm. teresa of calcutta um her confessor said that he was her confessor for 4 years and he said that whenever Mother Teresa travelled, she always carried three books with her, the Bible, the breviary, and a book by Maria Valtorta. And when he asked her, and his name is Father Leo Maysberg, when he said, well, what are these books about? And she said, just read it, just read it, she said, because you really can't explain it, you know. Um, and you've got to think that Padre Pio and Mother Teresa, they would never have gone against the church. So mm. had the church not approved them, they would never have been disobedient to the church. And and that brings us to the topic of the controversy related to the book. There's been a period of time uh, where the book was on the list of, um, what's, the, what's the list called? Un <laughs> unapproved Index books. Index of or? forbidden books. Yeah, yes. forbidden books. That's right. And it was on that list for a few years or a couple of years. I'm not sure exactly how many years, but... Yes. Um, since then, um, people have always thought twice and there's always been a lot of controversy about reading the book. Can you tell us a little bit about the history? Of course. Yes. Until 1966, there was an index of forbidden books and the body of clerics were called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the CDF, and they would put a book on this index if it went against faith or morals. So we often questioned, you know, why was Maria's work put on the index when, in fact, it was agreed that her work did not go against faith or morals? Well, for the first thing, she went on because of reasons of disobedience. You see, three Servite priests, they went straight to Pope Pius XII directly to bring him the work to read and to get his approval instead of going through the CDF, whose job it was to assess the books. And in 1948, Pope Pius XII granted permission to publish the work as it is, and this is an unambiguous official imprimatur under the Code of Canon Law granted by the Father before witnesses. And you see, no one below a Pope is permitted to go against that decision. So, you know, the Servite priests, they, they found a publisher and they printed the work and one month after Pope Pius XII died, the CDF put it on the index. So it was more because of an act of disobedience at that stage. But in 1959, 
when the next Pope, Pope John the 23rd, came onto the scene, he had never read the poem, but he merely signed the decree that passed his desk. It was a mere formality given to him by Cardinal Ottaviani. So he signed that, and I might say that Cardinal Ottaviani also um, got a signature to have Sister Faustina's book put on the index and also a ban on Padre Pio at that time. But by 19... was Sister Faustina's book on the index as well. Yes, and so was Mary of Agreda's City of God. That had been put on the index as well. Uh, um, but in 1915, uh, 1966, the next Pope, which is Pope Paul VI, he decided to get rid of the index and he abolished the canon law which required all private revelations needing an imprimatur before publishing. And public, public revelations still need an imprimatur but no longer a private one. In fact, Pope Paul VI, he read the poem and he added a copy of it to his seminary library in Milan and he wrote a letter of appreciation to the author of a book about the poem. Now, come 1993, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger took over from Cardinal Ottaviani from the CDF and um, he, never he never read the work and I think to avoid undermining his predecessor, he just maintained um, the book and left it on the index. But then in 1994, Pope John Paul II became Pope and he actually beatified an outspoken supporter of Maria Valtorta. So we can see that, um, that you know, there was a little bit of conflict because of that original um, decision that was made but then over time, you could see that the, the popes found there was a lot of beauty in it. And, and that's the reason that the current position of the church is the latest and currently judicially binding position of the church represented by the CDX decision mm -hmm. is to explicitly give permission to Dr. Pisani at the publishing house to continue publishing Maria Valtorta's work as it is without any needed modifications to the text. And in a letter dated the 6th of May, 1992, addressed to Dr. Emilio Pisani, Bishop Tetamanzi says, I give permission for the work to continue to be published for the true good of readers and the spirit of genuine service to the faith of the church. So regardless of the reason that the first edition was placed on the index of the um, forbidden books, there was effectively, this was effectively nullified mm -hmm. for those who approved the second and the subsequent editions. Therefore, her writings cannot be considered condemned or forbidden for the contemporary Catholics. And this action and permission also implicitly acknowledges that the work is free from error in faith and morals and it may be safely read by the faithful. How was that for a long-winded answer? But that was that so was important. A, a perfect answer, yeah. Yeah. And um, as you know, we're live, so we're going to be getting a lot of questions from our viewers on the live chat. So one of the questions already, how many volumes are there? Are there five volumes or ten volumes? Because the one that I'm reading, I'm currently reading, is ten volumes, but some people say there's five. This is the poem of the man God, the original one, in five volumes. And um, then when the next edition came out, it was renamed The Gospel as Revealed to Me, and it was in ten volumes. They are exactly the same, but they were divided in half. Right. And okay. That explains it. Yes. And there's two editions in English. There's the first edition that was not doesn't have an imprimatur and the second edition does is that correct well even the first edition um yeah the second edition does so the poem of the man god even bishop roman danilak gave an imprimatur for it but um if you read the gospel well they're exactly the same nothing was changed and that's what the letter said you don't have to change anything but now right. we give you permission so, the, but the content is exactly the same for anyone who has either edition. Mm. 
Mm. And are they available then, Catherine, in either the five volume or the 10 volume? Uh, Unfortunately, so the five volume is no longer available um, for the late, late eight years. And that's because um, Dr. Pisani wanted to make sure that all the volumes had some form of uniformity. So it didn't matter which language you were reading it in, you would always recognise it. So all the different countries are, are calling it the gospel as revealed to me and in 10 volumes. So you can cross check between the different languages if you wanted to. So the poem um, is no longer available. You can get it on eBay or something, but you're paying an arm and a leg because oh, people I, I, <laughs> I tried to replace them after I, <laughs> after I lost them in the move. When I moved to Florida six years ago, I lost um, all of my books. And um, and so there were my five volumes were were gone, and I did look, you know, places like that, and it's they're exorbitantly expensive. Um, mm. So I was really glad to see your website and that you had these available. And, um, and so I, they're they're available on your web. If someone's asked, where can you get it? Where's the best place to get it from? Well, if you're in Australia or in New Zealand, I always say you're more than welcome to contact me and get them from me. But even when, as I said, we speak to people from 18 English-speaking um, countries and if they contact me, I'll say, look, it's cheaper if you go to the foundation in Italy and get them because postage will be cheaper, not so much the books. The books are pretty much the same price. The postage can be exorbitant. So, mm -hmm. and I will direct people. I'm non profit, so I'm not out to make money, just to enable the enjoyment of people um, to read the works. Yep. I want to ask about a little bit more about the life of Maria Valtorta and the story behind her apparitions or visions that she received, how the book was written, that yeah. kind of thing. Okay, then. Um, if you can put up the image of Maria Valtorta so someone can see her all through her life there. She was born sure. in 1890. She was one born second. in 18... Sorry. You, you continue while I try to get it up. <laughs> okay. She was born in Italy in 1897 and she died in 1961. So she was 64 years old. She was an only child. She did have a loving grandmother and a loving father but her mother was hostile, controlling and very cruel. She had two opportunities to marry, but her mother put an end to both of those relationships. Now, when she was 23, a man struck her with an iron bar, which damaged her spine, and she was bedridden for three months, but she never really fully recovered. Her back was damaged. When she was 36, due to this back injury, she could no longer leave the house. And when she was 37, she was totally bedridden. She had seven major physical conditions. And she said that over that time, she was given 13,000 injections. Now, mentally, Maria was articulate, lucid. She was sane. She was a normal person, but she was very sick. Now, when she was 45 years old, Maria was asked to write her autobiography and Jesus wanted her to do that because he said to her, you need to forgive in order to deserve to have me as your teacher. So she wrote her autobiography and she really did need to forgive. She needed to forgive the military who cheated her father over an invention that he had come up with and her uncle that was always asking for money from the family and her mother. She needed to forgive her mother who was treating her so cruelly and also the husband. And by the time she wrote that autobiography, um, you know, she had reached that level of forgiveness. And the year later was her first spiritual encounter, which was a vision in 1942. And Jesus even asked her to be a victim soul. And she said, yes, I will accept because I want to save souls and uh, I want to atone for the sins of the world. Um, and then between 1943 and 1951, that's when she got the visions of the narrative and the narrative of the stories that we read or, um, read in the Bible and also the dictations on various topics. Um, but we did discover in the last five years of her life, she did lose her mental faculties. And in the English-speaking world, we didn't understand this. We thought, you know, I wonder why. 
But for those who could read Italian, they could read um, the letters that she wrote to a Carmelite nun. And it's the Carmelite nun that informs us, hasn't been translated into English yet, that in 1949, Maria had offered to God as a sacrifice for saving souls of not seeing the church approve her work. And she also offered the special um, gift of her intelligence, which was the only thing she had left to offer the Lord. And the Lord must have accepted it because um, after seeing the word, the work blocked so many times, Maria eventually became withdrawn in sort of a mental isolation. And she died in, you know, that 1961 when she was 64. But this work from Maria, it's so different to everything else. It's, um, it's not like anything else. There's no messages or prophecies to the world. There's no special devotion. There's no new prayer. There's no statue, no medal, no holy image. And Jesus gave us seven reasons um, for giving us this work. Um, one, there was modernism happening in the church, which was corrupting the doctrines. And Jesus says he wanted to give his, his pope and his bishops more material so that they could fight against the, um, the, the, those who deny the supernatural aspect of the faith. And he wanted to bring us back to the Bible. So that was the second reason. And the third, he wanted to give spiritual directors and teachers more information to, to lead the flock. He wanted to reinstate the truth about himself and his mother. And he wanted to have people to have um, exact knowledge of what his um, passion and death and how long it went for. He wanted to show how he interacted with people and how people responded to his, um, his word. And finally, which was interesting, he wanted people to be acquainted with the mystery of Judas and how much he loved Judas but was not able to save his soul. And Jesus says, I solemnly tell you that even after reading and accepting the illustration of my public life, you will still not know everything about me. And John's Gospel, chapter 21, verse 25 says, but there are also many other things that Jesus did which, if everything were written, the world itself, I think, would not be able to contain the books that should be written. So the next interesting thing was how did we actually get it? And, Ron, if I can trouble you to put up that yep. image. Uh, unfortunately, I've been trying to put it up. It's not working. So, <laughs> But if you can just okay. describe it. Sorry, I can't describe. put it up. Oh, hello. I've got a little, I've got a picture here, actually. Can you see that? Yes, it's just. Yep. That, yep. Anyway, that's an image of a pile of notebooks. Now, you've got to imagine two or three that high, okay? Now, if you imagine that pile, that's what was 122 handwritten notebooks. So if you imagine 122 of these piled up, and that's why it was called the work, because Jesus didn't dictate to Maria and, and let her see visions of... Um, his life in order, it was all mixed up. The only thing that kept it together were the dates. So when we got those um, notebooks or when Dr. Emilio Pisani got it, he had to do some extraordinary things, 15,000 handwritten pages. He had to go through a notebook and he put tabs on, for example, and the blue tabs meant, oh, that's going to go for the poem of the man God. And then the pink tabs, oh, that'll go for the notebooks. And they had to do that with all 122 um, 22 notebooks. And then they had these seven piles and then they had to go through all the dates to put them in some chronological order because they were mixed up. But it was, um, uh, and that's how we get the books. Now, Maria Valtorta only wrote seven books. I've got them here in front of me. Now, there are 10 volumes, but we're just going to count it as the one book here. She wrote the 10 volumes of the poem of the man God. This is the longest, most vivid and most true-to-life revelation of our Lord and our Lady's life with 4,200 printed pages of the visions. And Maria says, because they were visions, I was able to remember these very clearly. And it starts with, 
Anne and Joachim trying to conceive Mary, and by volume 10 it goes up to the assumption of, um, of Mary into heaven. Then there are these four notebooks, and these four notebooks, 1943, 44, these four um, notebooks here, they are dictations on different topics like mercy and justice, sin, heaven, hell, purgatory, limbo, the archangels, Mary Magdalene's death, the creation, evolution, the end times, and they were dictated from God the Father, the Holy Spirit, um, various saints, and Our Lady as well. We then have the Book of Azariah, and they were dictations by Maria's guardian angel on the 52 masses of the year in the old, uh, in the traditional mass, because now we've got years A, B, and C, but in the old times we only had the same readings. And the guardian angel comments on those gospel readings. And then lastly, Jesus gave her dictations on the lessons of the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. But unfortunately, that was never finished because the work was being blocked so much, Jesus said, I'm not giving you any more. So even though there was, I think, eight or ten chapters, it was never really completed. But I think, and then, That's of course, we've got, yeah, and then, of course, we've got Maria's autobiography. So what I want to um, point out to the um, listeners here, Maria only wrote eight books, okay? Okay, the, the gospel has mm. got ten volumes, but only wrote eight books. Now, when you go online, you will find many other books on Maria Valtorta. Oh, there's one on Mary Magdalene, The End Times, The Shroud. Now, those books are compilations or extracts from all her major works. So if you read her major works, you will have everything. But if you want to focus on a theme, there are other books. There's one on Joseph, one on Mary Magdalene, The wow. End Times. Yeah. Can so, you tell us a little bit about The Shroud? That will be, that'll be interesting to read. I never knew that she, she spoke about The Shroud. Oh, yes, she does. Um, and with the Putting shroud, you on the spot. <laughs> you are certainly putting me on the spot. Um, with regard to the shroud, um, she describes it as um, that Mary, at the end of the crucifixion, she was the one that said, look, let's get everything that we can, all the relics. Mary was the only clear-headed person at that time. And she got the lance and she got the shroud and she um, she got the crown of thorns. Um, she tried to get... Mary, the Our Lady or Mary Magdalene? Our Lady, Our Lady. And she put <laughs> it in a special chest with which Mary Magdalene gave to her. Um, but, yeah, the, the shroud is that uh, long piece of material which is pressed close to um, Jesus' body and left an imprint. And it left an imprint because, medically speaking, Jesus' body was um, exuding um, um, chemicals from his body which allowed for that imprint. And it really does show um, the before and after, what Jesus would have looked like. It showed all of his um, wounds um, and it showed that uh, um, it's it stretched out and not a long way, and you're on a little yes. travel agent when you go and I see it. I think a lot so, of people are familiar with what the shroud is. Oh, yes, yes they, they, yep, they certainly are. But it's certainly worth reading what Maria Valtorta has to say about mm, that shroud. Mm. And Maria Valtorta also talks about the veil that Mary gave Jesus when he was about to be crucified. Um, you know, they stripped them down just to make their punishment even worse. Um, and Mary gave Jesus her veil. And, uh, and that was the same veil that she was wiping Jesus' face when she was holding him after he'd been brought down from the cross. So we've got that as well. And she also talks, Maria Valtorta talks about um, the uh, Veronica's veil. So, um, yeah, there's quite and a few And that's elements. what's so beautiful about the book is it goes into so much intricate details about little events and little parts of our Lord's life that, you know, just... If we read it in the gospel, it, it's probably a passing verse, but it goes into, you know, extreme detail and it's just so precious and, and vivid and beautiful. Yeah. But Jesus does make it um, clear to people that Maria Valtorta's work is not the fifth gospel. I've heard people say, oh, it's the fifth gospel. Mm -hmm. No, it isn't. 
Jesus makes it clear in his um, little notebooks. He says, and now we come to the so-called fifth gospel. There are four gospels. I'm explaining them now in order to bring light to other gospels, which are lost or downplayed, but I am not creating another gospel. There are four yeah. and four there will remain. So, yes. but with yeah. regard to the um, supernatural, um, uh, it, it is supernatural and it can't be considered anything else because she was in bed for 27 years. She didn't have a TV. She only had the radio. And they even tried to examine her her library to see if she had all these other books that was giving her all this information and they found that she didn't. And her she's so accurate from a geographical point of view, from an uh, astronomical mm -hmm. point of view, um, and a medical point of view. Um, you know, experts have actually said... Um, from a medical point of view, um, let's have a look. Uh, with regard to Jesus' crucifixion, Dr. Nicholas Pendy says, what aroused in me the greatest admiration and amazement is the expertise which Valtorta describes um, about the, the crucifixion. In truly medical style, the descriptions constitute a phenomenon that only a few informed physicians would know how to explain. And she does it in an authentic medical style. And then the famous William F. Buckley, he also says either she was once a medical student or she studied anatomy bone by bone. And then there was that um, astronomical evidence that was given by mm. a Professor Van Zandt and he was really um, sceptical about Valtorta, but he only read Valtorta because his wife was reading it. And, he, and the wife said, hey, there's a scene here that has astronomical features in it, and it's a scene at Gandhara, a Gadara, sorry. Um, Do you think you can prove anything? And he says, oh, he says, I can just prove that in a minute. So he goes to the university in Indiana in the USA he uses a computer, planetary simulation. But before you get to that, can you describe that scene? Like, I think I've read that scene, and he talks about constellations in the sky and how the yes. sky might look like. He went into extreme detail. I don't have the um, the um, quote on hand. I had it and I deleted yeah. it. I don't have it on hand. But if she were not authentic, she would have said, oh, well, the sun's there, the planet's there or whatever. But she doesn't. She mentions about 10 or 12 stars in the sky. She mentions the lunar position, Jupiter. She mentions all of those. And, um, and as I said, he, um, he went to the computer and he said uh, he was actually, hang on, what does he say? He says she mentions so many planets and stars. He says given the joint visibility of these stars is uncommon, mm -hmm. the planets the star constellations and the lunar phase match up exactly to a specific date, March 33 AD. And uh, the professor says, Van Zandt, this work could not have been done without a computer. So, and not uh, only that, sorry, but also he mentions where that took place, like where on earth, and that took place exactly in, in Israel, in the land yeah. of the Palestine. So he doesn't only mention the date, but he mentions the location where the sky is visible. And that was that's, where Jesus was. And that's why it's so amazing. And the other amazing thing is um, she mentions 255 geographical sites in Palestine. Mm. Now, some of these weren't even in the 1939 Atlas. They were discovered after her death. 62 weren't even in the 1968 Atlas of the Bible. 52 had no biblical reference and 17 were indirectly confirmed in the 1968 Bible and then in the 1989 Atlas of the Bible. So she mentioned sites that weren't discovered archaeology, archaeology yep, by the archaeologists. Archaeologically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After she had died, so and there's no way she mm -hmm. never left Italy, never visited anywhere mm -hmm. um, outside Italy. So, did you want to read a passage now, or do you want to just continue with some um, some facts? 
Yeah, maybe we can read a little passage and then we'll continue with some questions and we'll get we'll read some questions from the audience as okay. well. Okay, that's good. Can you pull up the passage site there that I? Uh, is it on your website? I, I could pull up your website, but I can't pull up the word no, document. I can't. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. Then maybe well, I've got some favorite okay. passages well, maybe... from your website. Do you want me to pull that up? No, no, I'll, no. I'll show one... that one. Let me just show that anyway because I think it's a good website, a good page you know, to look at. Oh, on no, no. Can I, can I, can I, I've got it in front of me perhaps. Um, maybe people could just yeah. listen to it because it's a special one actually. Go ahead. Okay. Now this is at the Last Supper with the 12 disciples and Jesus mentions that someone is going to betray him. Jesus is speaking calmly. He seems to be supporting a thesis in a lear as a learned man may do with his pupils. The confusion is great, but Jesus' calm manner appeases it. But Peter is the most suspicious of Judas. Perhaps Jude Thaddeus, mind you, Jesus' cousin Judas um, changed his name to Jude because he didn't want to be um, associated with Judas. So Jude Thaddeus is also suspicious but he doesn't look so. Disarmed as he is by Judas Iscariot's easy manner, Peter plucks John's sleeve. And when John, who was pressed against Jesus upon hearing him speak of betrayal, he turns around and he whispers to John, ask him who it is. So John asks him quietly, Master, who is it? And Jesus in a low voice says to him, he is the one to whom I shall give a piece of bread dipped in the dish. Now taking another entire loaf of bread, not the remains of the one used for the Eucharist, he detaches a large morsel, he dips it in the lamb sauce left in the tray and says, take it, Judas, you like this. Oh, thank you, Master, I do like it. And unaware of what the morsel is, he eats it, while John is horrified to know who the betrayer is. He even closes his eyes so as not to see the horrid smile of the Iscariot and he bites the accusing bread with his strong teeth. Well, now that I've made you happy, go, says Jesus to Judas. Everything has been accomplished here. What is left to be done elsewhere? Do it quickly, Judas of Simon or Judas of Iscariot of Kyria, fear the three titles. Jesus says to the remaining disciples, do not say, oh, so if you chose us, why did you choose a betrayer? If you know everything, why did you do that? And don't even ask who he is. He is not a man. He is Satan. If Satan, the eternal mimic of God, had become incarnate in human flesh, this possessed man could not have escaped my power. And I said possessed. Ah, well, since you drive demons away, why didn't you free him, says James of Alpheus? Are you asking that for your own sake, fearing that you are the one? Be not afraid of that. Is it I then? Oh, is it I? Is it I? Ask the other disciples in turn. Jesus replies, be quiet. I'm not mentioning that name. I am being merciful. Do likewise. Why don't you defeat him? Couldn't you do that? Jesus says, I could. But in order to defeat Satan from taking bodily form to kill me, I would have to exterminate the whole human race before redemption. So what would I have redeemed? Tell me, Lord, tell me. Peter has fallen on his knees and he shakes Jesus frenetically as if he were a prey to frenzy. Is it I? Is it I? Shall I examine my own conscience? I don't think so. But you, you said that I will disown you, Lord, and I'm quivering. How horrible if it is I. Jesus says, no, Simon of Jonah, it's not you. Or why are you depriving me of my name, Peter? So you're calling me Simon again. See, you're saying so. Is it I? Oh, how could it be? Tell me, tell me, all of you. When was it that I became a traitor? Tell me. Peter, 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 I am calling you Simon because I'm thinking of our first meeting. You were Simon. And I'm thinking how you've always been loyal since the first moment. It's not you. Who then says Peter? It is Judas of Kerioth. Haven't you understood that yet, shouts Judas Thaddeus, who can no longer restrain himself. Why didn't you 
tell me before? Why, shouts Peter. Silence. It is Satan. He has no other name. Where are you going, Peter? To look for him. Put down that mantle and that weapon at once, or I shall drive you away and curse you. I gave you my commandment, love one another. Have you understood that? Even if the world there is hatred, only love and do not return evil for evil. So just in that passage, we learned so much. I mean, he used yep. the different Eucharistic bread. He didn't use the same one. And, and how the apostles reacted, I mean, all through the work, we see them being really tolerant of Judas, but he really did get on their nerves. And, and that's the beauty also of, um, of reading the work. We find out about Judas and his, his um, backstory and, and why he turned. He was only a couple of years older than John. He was one of the youngest one. And Judas's mother, oh, yeah. Jesus treated her so beautifully. So, yeah. And, and oh, I, I just so read that passage yesterday about Judas's mother and the final meeting with Jesus, oh. and Judas, it was just heartbreaking. Yeah, it's and there's yeah. also the shepherds in the Bible. We see the shepherds when they get announced that, um, that they're going to you know find the baby Jesus, and the second time we see them is when they go to see Jesus in the manger. But in Maria Valtorta's work, first we see one shepherd when. Joseph and Mary are on the way to Bethlehem and Joseph says to the shepherd, could you please give me some milk for my wife who is pregnant? And uh, and the shepherd said, yes. And by the way, he said, you won't find anywhere to stay. Go to the stables. So it was a shepherd who told them to go to the stables. And then we see them, of course, with the angels who make the announcement. Then we see the shepherds again when they go to um, see Jesus. And when Jesus starts his public life, he goes to find all the shepherds. Two of them are dead, but he goes That's to right. find them all. And then we see them again at the passion and death of Jesus. When Jesus rises from the dead, he goes to, uh, he appears to the shepherds. When Jesus ascends into heaven, the shepherds are there as well. And the most beautiful part is that they needed a 12th apostle. And there were two people who applied, Matthias and Joseph. Well, Matthias changed his name. And he was originally Tobias, one of the shepherds. So one of the shepherds ended up becoming the 12th apostle. And the other one was um, Joseph, and he was Joseph Junior. His father was another shepherd that um, the angel had appeared to. So when you find out all this information, it's just so heartwarming. Um, yeah, it's amazing, it's, yeah. It, it, it's, it is. You, you really need to read it for yourself. Like there's no words to, to describe the the detail and, you know, it's there's it's full of gems. It's full of amazing discoveries about our faith. And one thing I wanted to mention was that Our Lady of Medjugorje herself recommends the book. Do you know about that? Yes, I do. Um, she, she mentioned it to two people. She said, yes, the poem of the man God is the truth. If a person wants to know Jesus, he should read The Poem of the Man God by Maria Valtorta. That book is the truth. So, yes. yes. And she said on two occasions that that book is the truth. So that's that's a great validation that Our Lady herself. And she said it to one of the two of the seers or one seer from Medjugorje? She said it to two remember. seers, Vic, Vicka and seers. Maria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she did. But you know what? Um, and I think that Mother Teresa and um, Mother Teresa and Pope Pius X, you know, said it beautifully. You can't explain what the book is; just read it, because whoever reads it will understand. Um, and that's the best response you can give to people: is you know, just read it, and and then you will know, you will discern yourself. You know, the church has given permission to read it. Start from the beginning of the story, and just allow yourself to be taken through. Um, taken through yes and, and I, one person go on debbie i'll i'll, I'll comment next I, I just wanted to say you know as we were talking about the the uh, the shepherds and i think one of the things that you see the, so many of the beautiful uh connections that are woven through the whole the whole book the whole uh, all of the visions and you and you begin to get a sense of how omnipotent God is, how, 
how uh, he 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 has his hand he touches every bit of everything and um you know just just in that in this one little uh, uh, example of the shepherds and um how the shepherds were involved all the way past his death um and that every every detail every tiny thing is touched by the hand of God and that, you know, we can take that into our lives as well, that every little thing is touched by the hand of God um, and it has purpose and it has meaning and there's something that it's connected to. And this is one of the, just the most beautiful things. And someone in the comments had said, when you read it, you can't help but know that it has to be the truth because there's no other way that it could it could happen. There's no other way that it could be described and explained and, and narrated the way that it is. And I just thought that the, the the connection that you were talking about about the shepherds was just so beautiful, so beautiful. Um, I didn't remember the part about the the inn, um, but that absolutely makes sense because you know, of course, God was leading them every step of the way and sort of like leaving. <laughs> Like leaving his little breadcrumbs, you know, mm-hmm. just follow me, like follow, follow. I'm, I'm leading you. Um, it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, but, I wanted to mention one of the comments from Leon, and I thought she put it really well. That one of the greatest um, proofs is a, is a proof of grace. She says, also the spiritual proofs that occur during listening or reading the book. For example, when I try to be there with. Jesus in his suffering, my heart gets flooded with love, spirit, spiritual milk, grace. And I think that's one of the greatest, as you were talking about as well, Debbie, that's one of the greatest evidences or proofs of the supernatural nature of this writing is that it's just it just helps you become full of God's grace, doesn't it? Like you can feel God's grace when you're reading it. I can't even talk about it. I, I'm sitting here, you know, tearing up because I can't even talk about it without um getting a little emotional because it's just it's a it's a very so emotional book. so well depending on depending on time i had another little passage ready and 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 i as as i was reading it it was this scene on the cross with justice and um dismas the good thief and the bad thief um and and just reading that i just started crying i thought i can't read that aloud you have to read it yourself you become so emotional about the discussion that was happening I mean, they were on, Jesus was on the cross for three hours, and um, yeah, it was just, it was just so moving. I mean, the whole thing is, and sometimes when we have our, our Zoom meetings, we have um, our book club on Zoom. People pick different passages, and uh, we share those passages, and everyone talks about a passage that has touched them in some way, mm-hmm. and um, they are all beautiful. And, and someone would say, "Oh, I haven't prepared a passage." Yet doesn't matter. You can open the book anywhere and you will read something significant in that. Um, in Every that single book. chapter. I'm, I'm reading, I'm listening to the audio version. So there's chapters. I'm not sure if the book, I'm sure the book will have the chapters as well, but every chapter there's something really significant and powerful to take out of. Can you tell us a little bit about the book club? Is the book club available? Um, oh, yes. Tell us about it. Um, it, 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 um, it happened during the pandemic, actually. A lot of people were just looking for other people to, to talk to about this work. A lot and, happened on Zoom during the pandemic. It, it, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So we went on, so we, we, um, we've been doing Zoom meetings and I've got two sessions going. I've got the, the first session is with Australia, New Zealand, um, Canada, USA, Chile, that continent as well as um, Korea and Indonesia. So that's one session. And then the other session is um, the UK and Ireland, um, Europe and Africa and and the Australians as well. Um, And we just meet once a month. One prepares a passage, just half a page or a page. They'll read it out and then they'll comment on why that passage was so meaningful to them. And then everybody else joins into that discussion. And then the next person will read a passage that they like. Um, 
and then they'll explain, you know, what was so important. And that's what people want. They want to be able to see other people and they want to be able to share, oh, did you read this passage and that passage? We never enter into debates or discussions about the work. It's more about an appreciation of the work and that's mm -hmm. and that's what we're about. So um, people just who are, I've got over a 1,000 people as, as members and uh, I just email them once a month. If you can come, come. Sometimes it's a small group, sometimes it's a larger group. But, um, yeah, we, we, do, we do love having the Zoom meetings. Well, I think, you know, you bring up a good point. And, and as I said, this was many, many years ago that my friend gave me the first volume and she actually ended up giving me about three of the five volumes. I, I, uh, she had several, several copies of them. Um, and she would give them away because they're so extraordinary that you have to share them. They're so extraordinary that you, like you said, you can't explain it. You have to read it for yourself and you want to share it with other people. You want to talk about it with other people, but you really need to talk about it with other people who have read because you can't understand or explain it until you've experienced it for yourself. Yes. And so I think the book, the, the book club is a, is a beautiful, wonderful idea. Uh, and, and people have, share people have contacted theory. me and said, are there other people in America that I can get in contact with and we can have our own book club? So there are some smaller ones around, um, but these are the more the international ones. And if you wanted to start reading the work, the, the best way is Ron mentioned our website, valtorta.org.au. And on the left I'll hand side. I'll put that up right now for people to see. Yeah. There are tabs on the left-hand side. Now, if you read out, and this is all free, but I'm, I'm telling you, the quarterly newsletters are like these um, supplements, four pages, and they're on different themes. So you could read those, and if you like those, you might decide to, to buy the work yourself. There's another tab there on some favourite passages. There's another tab there on Vol Valtorta Audio where you can listen to the Sunday Gospels or the Scriptural Rosary. There's also a Valtorta app, which is free for iPhones, Androids and tablets. And once a week you get the Sunday Gospel sent to you with the Maria Valtorta equivalent and you can either listen to it or read it. And, of course, there's the free e-book that Stephen Austin wrote, the Summa and Encyclopedia of Maria Valtorta's Extraordinary Work. And he's got everything in that. So... Um, it really is worth having having a look. So, and it doesn't. Are, so, um, it sorry? really complements your reading of the gospel, doesn't it? So that's why it really does well to complement the Sunday yes. reading of the gospel as a meditation. Yes, indeed. But you know what? We are so blessed. We're living in a time when we've had printing of. Uh, we've got so many apparitions. So many books are printed from different devotions. And look, if Maria Valtorta isn't a, appealing to you, it doesn't matter. Find something that will bring you closer to your faith. And believe me, um, Maria Valtorta helps you do that. Um, and as, you know, St Thomas Aquinas said, to one who has faith, no explanation of Maria Valtorta is necessary. <laughs> to one without faith, no explanation is possible. I just yeah. threw in the Maria Valtorta bit. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know you did. So it's, um, yeah, it's just so beautiful. Um, it's so beautiful to read. And if you read two chapters a day, you will have read the whole ten volumes in one year. So, oh, or if that's you read one chapter, yeah, one chapter a day, you will read um, the whole ten volumes in two years. It depends how you want to pace yourself. Right. Yeah, um, and it's something you can just continue reading throughout your life, like as a meditation book. Like it's just something that you'll never get sick of. And there's always, you could go deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. uh, could you post the links? Yes, the links are posted in the descriptions of this video. So if you go into the description section, I'll put all the links there. So um, it's the link to your website there. And, and through your website, you can get all the other links as well. Uh, and I think the work has been the translated course, into 30 languages. 30 languages. Did you say? And the, the interesting thing, one that I wanted to bring up 
the interesting one that I wanted to bring up was the, um, the one in Russia. It was a priest in Russia contacted Italy and said, can we translate it into Russian? And he translated the first two volumes and then he was murdered. Um, and then another priest, an Orthodox priest, he learned Italian so he could translate it. Wow. And Dr. Pisani says, which little angel took Maria Valtorta's work to um, Russia? Russian priest wanted it. He wanted to bring um, a discussion between Catholics and the Orthodox because the Catholics follow St. Peter and follow St. Andrew. And Maria Valtorta gives such That's a right. biography yeah. of St. Andrew. These two were brothers. You know, That's let's right. have a discussion. And he was Amen. here on the 31st of January. Sorry, you're cutting, you're cutting off. I'm there. sorry I talk so much, but it's, it's, um, oh, no, it's no, no, no. So Sorry, were you cutting off there, uh, Catherine? I'm not sure. Debbie, did were you hearing the last part? Um, I didn't hear the last part, but I think. Uh, so, what were you saying, um, uh, Catherine? Sorry, you were cutting. You were cutting off there towards the end, Catherine. Yeah. I was just. Uh, no, I think I there's a problem with your connection. I'm speaking a lot because I'm just so excited to talk to. You. Okay. No, we're glad if for you to speak you a lot. Read it there's as a well. lot to Some know here. Lot. Yeah. yeah, so unfortunately there's some connection issues there, Catherine, but that that's great. Um, Debbie, did you have any final words or reflections? Well, I would just Catherine say gets a connection better. go to the website. Uh, there's a wealth of information there. It's a wonderful site, and there there is so much information. And uh, there is a lot to this. It's, it's the, a large, large uh, piece of work, um, but uh, it's worth diving into. Listen to it audibly. Uh, read it. I read it. When I read it, um, initially there was no audible available but um any way that you can can get it and and even if you think you're not interested i absolutely would just go in and and, and listen or read a portion of it because i think you'll be amazed at the at the detail at the um at the grace there, there's just no other word for it at the grace that you get um uh, that that god transmits um through these writings, and um, as I said in the beginning, I, I think you know the only the only thing I can almost do to describe it is just say that this is such an intimate experience of of uh, the life of Christ and um, everyone around him that uh, you you feel this extraordinary connection that I have never felt any other way, and. Um, uh, uh, you 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 come to know Jesus and Mary and Joseph and uh, you know the just everyone who who's involved, but especially it it truly affects your it it did for me anyway affects your relationship with Jesus and Mary because you feel like you know them and see them and experience them in such a real and intimate way that you can't help but be moved by it and drawn to it and uh, feel like you're really part of it. And uh, it's just an extraordinary experience. It's a very emotional experience um, uh, because we all spend our lives, our, our, our Christian lives are spent um, reading and studying scripture, going to mass, doing all the things that we do in order to uh, connect and have this intimate experience uh, of God and particularly with Jesus. And this is almost um, 
such a um, almost instantaneous way to get that that it's it's just extraordinary and so i would just encourage everyone and i think this is what padre pio was so um uh taken with and why he was encouraging everyone to experience this because you would have this intimate connection this intimate personal experience yeah, experience yeah um so you know that that's all i have to add but i i just want to thank catherine so much for uh taking the time to spend with us and um uh this this is a <laughs> it's a big work and it and it's a it, um the work that you're doing with the website and and um, and how you're spreading this is is really beautiful and extraordinary and and I I just want to thank you for taking the time to share that with us and share that with our viewers because um, well, that, that website um, really needs the credit really needs to go to Stephen Austin um, he's the one that's put his heart and soul into that. Um, but we've had lots of testimonials from people that have had conversions after reading it. We've had cradle Catholics who have become more fervent in the faith. We've had uh, Catholics who have married outside of the Catholic Church and they have witnessed their spouse becoming Catholics because of the fullness of the faith. But we've had so many Protestants who have read the work and they have joined the Catholic Church as a result and they have become strong advocates for Maria's work and for the Catholic faith. So um, what, what more can I say? Yes. Really, yes. yes. It's beautiful. Um, Would you be able to, maybe we could finish off with her, um, just a little bit about Maria Baltorta and her cause for, um, you know, canonization or yes. beatification. Is that a possibility? Um. I don't think it is, and I'll tell you why. First, I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, in order for a person to be declared a venerable and then a saint uh, and then a blessed and then a saint, um, the Vatican has to go through every piece of material that is available on that person. And so far, everything that they've read, the witnesses, um, everything Maria has said and done, she, would, she could be declared venerable. The only problem is... She was very close to Father Berti and Father Migliorini. And when they died, their material or their letters have been put in an archive and they're not available to the public yet, let alone to the Vatican. So until the Vatican gets access to that material, they can't move forward in declaring um, Maria Valtorta available at this stage because they have to read everything. Now, I don't think there's anything incriminating in that information, but... They know, oh, there are letters there. We need to see them first, and they're not available yet. So, but it doesn't matter. Look, Maria would have been happy that everybody's reading her work, and um, and we can only continue to pray for Maria to be recognised for this work too. Yeah. Uh, would you like to finish off with any final thoughts or comments? So maybe um, you said you wanted to read a part. I know that there's a lot of uh reference from our lord to how how much he loves his mother and that that really shines through in the in reading the book on the devotion to our lady and the devotion that he instilled in his apostles to our lady as well that's something that's remarkable and that i think a lot of protestants will be surprised as well like he said if they read the book on how our lord you know encourages devotion and veneration to his mother Well, there would be too many passages um, to look at, and yes. that's why I think if people went to the website, they might find they might find that passage. But um, there is that one scene where Jesus is with all his disciples, and he's got that little boy Bargium with him, and Jesus is talking to us about Mary and her purity, and and um, you know, um, and then the. Little Little boy Margin goes around and he, he said, you and I like you. And then he said to Judas, I think he says, I'm afraid of you. But it was during that time that he Jesus went into about Mary. She never regardless 
you know, she was asked a question, just like the Bible. She says, leave me out. My role is to teach Jesus. But we learned so much about her. Um, oh, yeah, from the time she was three years old. It was just beautiful. Just beautiful, yeah. Amen. All right, well, let's close with a prayer. Would you like to do a prayer for us, Catherine, or would you like to read as a passage to finish off? It's up to you. I know that your connection's not the oh, best. Um, I won't do a passage because if you take it out of context, you will, you know. I, I, I will um, end in a prayer. Let us remember that we are in the holy presence of God. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity of meeting with other people who are interested in Maria Vellatorta. Help us to take away something from this podcast that will enrich our life and that we can share with other people and that will bring glory to your name and to Maria Vellatorta. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, Catherine, and we'll love to have you on again in the future to just to have some more discussions and maybe you might even go on Debbie's channel as well in his will uh, to do some more discussions on the book. So hopefully we'll see you again. And thank you, everyone, for joining in. Until next time, God bless you all. Yes. Bye-bye.